Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mish Packer. Welcome to Threshold of Hope. And today's a very special one because it is Mother Angelica's 87th birthday. And it's just a marvelous thing. You know, you see her, uh, you know, she's been around here for a while now. And as we know, you know, uh, back in 2001, she had a couple strokes and a cerebral hemorrhage. And so she can't speak very well. She speaks a little bit but not too much. It's really hard for her. Though, in talking to the sisters, they said that she speaks better when you get her mad at you. <laughs> so some things haven't changed. <laughs> but, you know, this is, this is a great uh, opportunity for us to celebrate Mother and, and her heritage. Um, th this network was her idea, and it came not just out of her labor, it really came out of her faith in Jesus. And that was key, key. She trusted him to do all of this and have this start with nothing. Remember, she had $200 in the bank. That's it. And you know now it, it costs us 30 some million dollars a year to run all over the world. Now for, chi for uh, you know, the TV and radio, that's really cheap. Uh, you can barely do an episode of a TV show for the amount of money we run the whole radio and TV globally, reaching every continent except Antarctica, because as I've heard, none of the penguins are Catholic. <laughs> oh, we got pe people from P Pittsburgh. So those, those, those penguins are Catholics, maybe. But uh, still, the ones in Antarctica are not. <laughs> but, you know, apart from that, we're, we're in every continent. It's remarkable. And I am convinced that we would not be able to tell the history of the Catholic Church in America and in other parts of the world without Mother Angelica. You know, what's happened as a result of her work uh, and her listening to our Lord and her trusting Him at difficult times. One of my favorite lines that I learned from her is, I have all the trust in the world in Jesus. My stomach just doesn't always know it. <laughs> And that was the great thing about her. She was herself. She was herself. She didn't put on an act. She, you, if you didn't like her off stage, you wouldn't like her on. That, that was mother. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that was clear, a lot of people in the church love their own ideas, plans, and I institutions and such. Mother loved Jesus first. And then she loved the people of God, and you could tell she loved you. That, was, that always was clear in all the programs. And that's why people responded to her. And I know some theologians were frustrated. She doesn't even have a college degree and all this. She loved Jesus, and she loved us. That came across, and we can all learn from that. All right. Well, let's take a look uh, at some of the emails that you've sent. Remember, you can send us emails by writing to threshold at EWTN.com. Uh, first email said, Dear Father Packwood, during an EWTN televised homily from a date before this past Easter, you mentioned two times in the Bible both Jesus and Satan were symbolized by the same type of animal. In this particular case, the animal creature was a snake because it was used on the staff of Moses to save the Israelites, and that represented Jesus on the cross, right? Because he said, just as Moses lifted up this serpent, uh, so will the Son of Man be lifted up. But then also the serpent in the Garden of Eden represents Satan or the devil, as does the, the ancient serpent in the book of Revelation. Okay? You never got to the second example in your homily. <laughs> Despite asking some fellow members of my parish and some research, I have not been able to determine the second animal that, re that symbolizes Jesus and Satan both. And that's from um, Mike in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Well, it's so simple. Also from the book of Revelation and from Peter, the lion. Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the lamb of God, but also the lion of the tribe of Judah which is also referenced back to Genesis chapter 49, where Jude, Judah is said to be like a lion's whelp. But also, in 1 Peter 5, it says, Satan prowls about the earth like a roaring lion, seeking to devour your souls. So Satan is symbolized by the lion, 
and uh, by the serpent, and Jesus is symbolized by a lion and a serpent. All right? And with the lion ones, this is why maybe some people like cats and some don't. I don't know. <laughs> no, it's nothing to do with that. It's, that's different. All right. <clears throat> Dear Father Mitch, there are a couple of priests in my region who will frequently mention during their homily the great religions of Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and Buddhism. I was taught in Catholic school and by various texts approved by the Vatican that Christianity, being Catholic, is the only true religion. I understand that Judaism was the forerunner and their belief is the one true God, but Islam and Buddhism fall into a whole different category. Being recognized as religions by their own believers is one thing, but for our religious personnel and lay people to equate them with Christianity seems to be a slap in our face, not to mention being against what Jesus taught about the true faith. I've been seriously shaken at the number of, pol quote, politically correct homilies and, quote, prayer intentions during some celebrations of the Mass. Should Christianity be equated to these other two ways of life during Mass? Uh, Tom from Uniontown, Pennsylvania. No, no, you, 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 we don't equate Christianity with Buddhism and Islam. Now, what I do recommend, Tom, is that you take a look at Nostra Aetate, which is the document on uh, uh, ecumenism and non-Christian religions, not so much ecumenism and non-Christian religions, from Vatican II. And the attitude of the Vatican Council was to look at each religion and see the positive things that are there. There are many values that we share with Buddhism. There is, for instance, a desire to be distant from desires, that's one of the goals of Buddhism, that you don't get yourself caught up by desires for the things of this world so you can be free of them and seek, you know, you know beyond. But Buddhism cannot be equated with Christianity because Buddha, Buddhism is agnostic. It doesn't say there is no God. It doesn't say there is a God. So you can't, we say there is a God. But they don't, so you can't equate them. Same thing with Islam. There's a high respect for Jesus, but they, they call him Isa, which is more like the word Esau, rather than Yeshua, which is Jesus. They deny that he was crucified. They believe that he was without sin and that Mary, his mother, conceived him as a virgin by God's power. That they believe, but they deny that he's God. Uh, and, the, and they also have a confused trinity. They think that we mean by the trinity God, Jesus, and Mary. And that's not what we mean. We mean Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and one God. So we cannot equate them. And there'd be a wide variety of more that we can go into. So we have to make uh, uh, some very important distinctions uh, while at the same time recognizing that Islam, for instance, does have a very strong concern for the poor. Now doing zakat, that is taking alms for the poor and charity to the poor, is extremely uh, high. It's one of the five pillars of the faith. That's good. But we, we're going to disagree. And, we, and what we do is we look for those points of contact so we can have a conversation, but we don't equate them with, with Christianity. We do believe that Christianity is the norm. Uh, and in the case of Judaism and Christianity, we believe Christianity completes Judaism. But that doesn't you know, deny Judaism. It just says that this is, we believe that this completes it. And you know, most Jews know that. You know, they, uh, if we didn't believe that, we'd be Jewish. You know, I would become a Jew if I didn't believe that Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. So, you know, because it is, we, we believe it's a true revelation of the one God. So there, there are a lot of things like that, and we can be subtle, but we can't just equate them. It's not like some people try to say, different spokes all leading to the same center of God. No, they're not. They're, they're different pathways, different pathways. All right, and then uh, one last one. Uh, dear Father Mitch, a while ago I attended a first penance celebration, and the priest preached to the second grade students, but he said that sin is oops. He then instructed everyone in the church to say oops. I thought oops was appropriate when you spill your orange juice on the floor. <laughs> Can't a second grader learn about sin in a more spiritual context, such as not doing what God wants and disobeying God's rules? Can you enlighten me since I found oops to be a bit silly even for a youngster? The sacrament of penance deserves better. Kevin in Orlando, Florida. Well, Kevin, I, I agree. Um, you know, the reason I say oops when I, I, I say oops, you know, when I spill something, right? Um, that's because I didn't mean to do it. 
And it's usually, you know, not any uh, sin on my part to spill something. You know, if I poured it out, that might be a sin because it's somebody else's milk or something. But if I'm, if I make it, if I trip and fall and, you know, say, oops, that's, that's just a mistake. Sin is something else. It's deliberate. And we have to, see, the problem with it is it doesn't teach the kids that you have to include your free will in the decision to go against God's law. And that God has a law, you have to obey it, or you choose to disobey it. So it's not just an oops, it is something that is more serious. And kids understand that because they have been growing up with their mother and father telling them from the time they could understand, you better not, (laughs) or something along that line. You know, that uh, yeah, I told you no. Uh, and because you say you can't play with the stove, for instance. And they know what's wrong and right. And they, they don't understand sin, but by second grade, they should be able to start. And you want to help them develop that, not revert back to making them a, just a, an accident. Uh, sin is no accident. Sin is something that we do by our free will and not teaching about the free will. And again, I understand that somebody might be trying to uh, show a better sense of uh, how to communicate with a kid, but you also want to educate them. <laughs> they, they can learn. They can learn. Uh, how many of you, when you were in second grade, heard that you went to confession because you committed a sin? I did. You know, it was. They, I didn't. I understood that. I, un- I understood sin and punishment. That had come long before that. <laughs> Mom and Dad was helpful. All right, let's go on now to this, the, the document we're looking at, which is Pastoris Dabo Vobis. This is the document on the priesthood, uh, the exhortation by Pope John Paul the Great. And you can get a free electronic copy of Pastoris Dabo Vobis at our website, ewtn.com. Go to the television tab, click where it says television series, scroll down to Threshold of Hope. Then you'll see the document there, linked under Threshold, and then you can... Click that and put it into your computer. Highlight it, download it in your computer, and either print it out or read from your computer. Okay? All right. We are in paragraph 70. And what we've been doing, this begins chapter 6. And this chapter is talking about the continuing or the ongoing formation of priests. That after seminary, they still are not done yet. All right? They still have more to learn. A lot like us husbands. Those, or lose those of you who are husbands. Yet, don't you have a lot more to learn when you're a husband? <laughs> Wives learn a lot too, don't they? <laughs> well, on, ongoing formation is part of everybody's life, or should be. If you think you already know it all, you already got a big problem, right? That's not a good start in anything, including the priesthood. And he wants to give the theological motivations. That's not just a practical issue. There's a theology behind these, um, th- this ongoing um, uh, education. Starts off with, for the priest, understanding the sacrament of holy orders, which by its nature is a sign, like all sacraments. How many remember from the Baltimore Catechism? What is a sacrament? A sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. There you go. See, we know that. And that, that's why the Baltimore Catechism is so useful. Well, isn't it what you feel about it? No, it's not what you feel. This is what it is. And that this, so the sac- holy orders is a sign like all the other sacraments. But as a sign, it's also the word of God. You know, again, it was instituted by Christ. It was not just simply a a bunch of apostles saying, let's have a confab and we'll figure out a good way to do things. No, Christ instituted the priesthood. So that makes it a word of God. And it's a word of God that calls and sends forth the priest. Just like marriage. It's something God instituted in the Garden of Eden. And it calls the married to be sent forth. So also with the uh, sacrament of holy orders. And as such, the, the sacrament of holy orders is the strongest expression of the priest's vocation and mission. You know, a, a man might be in seminary and think about being a priest and all this, but it's the actual ordination ceremony 
which is that firm expression that makes him a priest. And it's not just that he wants to be one. It's just like your wedding day. You can want to be married before the wedding day. You can pretend being married before the wedding day, but it's the wedding day that makes the difference. So also with the ordination, that's why it's a long ceremony. It really gets across that this is an, exp uh, an expression and by the, uh, of the vocation and mission of the priest. And by the sacrament of holy orders, God calls the candidate to the priesthood, Coram Ecclesia. Now, Coram Ecclesia means in the presence of the church or before the church, okay? Because except in certain situations of persecution, for instance, I, I found out about a bishop who was consecrated a bishop in a hotel room in Moscow before the patriarch left Russia, the USSR in those days, to go to the Vatican Council. And he wanted to make sure there would be a bishop because he suspected correctly that the communists wouldn't let him back in the country. So he ordained a priest uh, uh, into a bishop secretly so that then he could make more bishops and priests. But that's rare. That's rare. That's persecution situation. And now that's a blessed Vasil Velichkovsky. Now, priests, though, and bishops are ordained or consecrated quorum ecclesia in front of the church, before, before the church, in presence of the church. Um, and so that's a very important part. That's why when Jesus says to, to someone, come follow me, that this gets proclaimed publicly in the sacramental celebration. It's not something that the priest keeps in his heart, but in front of the people of God, through the bishop. He hears Christ say, come follow me. And that this is a definitive and full celebration and proclamation of that. And it is made manifest and communicated by the church's voice. The church speaks out this word of come follow me and be ordained a priest. It does so in the words of the bishop who prays for the priest. There's a, there's a prayer of ordination. And then after that prayer, he lays his hands on the priest to ordain him. And, and the priest, um, you know, is there at the ordination ceremony to give his own response uh, in saying to, to Jesus, because that's what this is about. It's not about uh, accepting a nice career choice I've said that throughout studying this whole uh, exhortation, priesthood is not a career choice. It's a responding to Jesus. And it's saying back to him, I am coming to follow you. At that moment, you know, the, it, you have this response is a fundamental choice. But just like in your marriage, how many of you think it's men in particular, because it's usually we men that, do this. How many men think it's a good idea to forget your wedding anniversary? <laughs> Is that a good idea? <laughs> your wives are looking. <laughs> and of course, it's not a good idea, is it? Why? Is it because your marriage ceremony meant nothing? Or is it rather that the anniversary is a renewal of it? And making retreats and having weekends, you know, where you, the kids go to grandma's house and mom and dad get a chance to get away and just be with each other. Isn't that not a good thing for a married couple? Because you need to renew your marriage to each other. And you've got the kids there, sure, and you love them, but you need to renew that time alone. Well, so also, the priest has to uh, renew and reaffirm all through his years uh, the, the, in, in various ways uh, the yes of holy orders. So you don't just say it once. That's why we also celebrate our anniversaries. Now that's important um, for us. It'll be 34 years for me this year. You know, it's starting to be that the uh, people who, uh, <laughs> whose weddings I did, uh, and whose kids I baptized, and now their kids are getting married. <laughs> that happens, doesn't it? <laughs> so this is how we can then s speak about uh, and this is what he wants us to understand, is a vocation within the priesthood. The fact is, God continues to call the priest and send him forth. Just like 
in those times together and at wedding anniversaries and special dates and dinners together as a married couple, that is renewing your call from Christ to your spouse. So also the priest needs to have that. And this is so that, uh, the, you know, as God can, calls us forth, he reveals his saving plan in the historical development of the priest's life. You know, that, you know, my life has gone in ways quite different than what I expected. You know, there was no EWTN, and I didn't plan on being here at EWTN. That was not part of my mentality. I was looking forward to being a professor and teaching uh, Bible and Hebrew and just Greek and all that stuff. That would have been fine. Um, but my life has taken different turns. Okay, that's, that's life. And uh, in terms of the life of the church as well. You know, the church was different as I went through seminary and all the way till today than it was when I first started seminary in 1963. I was uh, in high school when I started seminary, high school seminary. And things in the church have changed a lot from those days when there were over 700 young men in my class. Just my class. The freshman class, 1963. And... Then this ongoing, uh, and, and now today we don't have so many. You know, so these are uh, big differences in the church, and society has changed. We've gone through the racial change, the, the war in Vietnam, and sexual revolution, and the drug revolution, and the breakdown of family, and a wide variety of other problems. The end of the Cold War, but the beginning of a new war of terrorism. You know, we've, we've seen lots of changes in society. We have to deal with all that and renew our call within the situation that exists, not the way it used to be, the way it is today. So, uh, and of course, within the church, you know, we, we're dealing very much with this uh, sexual crisis, you know, which I may talk about some more later. It is in this perspective that the meaning of ongoing formation emerges. This is why we have to have ongoing formation. You know, that we don't stop learning. And permanent formation is necessary in order to discern and follow this constant call from God and to always discern the will of God in every situation we're in. This is very important. And, you know, in terms of, the say, the sexual crisis, one of the things that all of us priests must do in order to stay active within the priesthood is do ongoing education about this so that the boundaries are real clear, because obviously they were not clear enough for at least 1.7% of the priests. You know, that's, that's the percentage that we're talking about. I just saw a study, uh, a couple studies today, one said 1.74, another said 1.8, so it's right in that range, it's not even 2% of the priests. Uh, but still, that's enough that all of us have to have ongoing study, you know, because it's horrid enough. Now, we can see this in the Apostle Peter, okay? And how he was called to follow Jesus even after the resurrection from the dead. And we saw that in the gospel recently where Christ entrusted the flock to Peter in John 21, verse 17 to 19, where Jesus said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Remember, he asked twice before, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? talking about ongoing formation. Three times Jesus asked if he loved me. He said, Lord, you know everything you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you girded yourself and walked where you would. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish to go. And this was said to show by what death he was to glorify God. And after this, he said to him, follow me. Now, Peter had already been called to be the rock. That's what his name means. You know, Tefa. You know, Tefa is the Aramaic for rock. And they uh, Hellenized it, they made it Greek like with Kephas. But it, it, um, Petros is the translation of Kepha. It means rock. And it doesn't mean a little rock. Um, sorry to the folks from Arkansas. But uh, Peter, <laughs> Peter means a crag of stone. A Petros or a Kepha are, is a crag of stone. You can see its use in uh, the book of Job that way. And yet, Jesus continues to call him, doesn't he? He still gives him this call. And that's why you have this follow me. 
that's part of Peter's whole life. Even at the Last Supper, he said, pray, Peter, I've prayed for you so that after you fall, you might strengthen your brethren. Now he's given a call again that's repeated. Remember, also Peter had been told to be a fisher of men. And then after the resurrection, what did he do? He went back to fishing for fish. <laughs> Don't! No, come back. Uh, and I, let's start, forget the fisher of men. I'll make you a shepherd. Like Jesus is the good shepherd. We'll be hearing that this coming Sunday. Peter's to share in that. And, you know, this is something that's very important, uh, that Peter keeps on hearing that call repeated. And of companies, the whole mission, it's to follow me, that Jesus says, that's in line with the call and demand of faithfulness unto death. Again, I said, why it's not a career choice. This is a faithfulness to death, like marriage. Marriage is to be faithful till death do you part. Well, since the church isn't going away, I stay until death. And I want to be active as a priest until then. Of course, as time gets on, I may, might diminish some of my strength and, and ability and energy. But I know Jesuits in their 90s who are still working. I, I knew one Jesuit priest who taught Latin class till he was 93. He stopped then because he, he died. But, uh, but he, he would go for a swim in Lake Michigan and then go back and work in the archives, largely because he was there when the stuff originally happened. <laughs> <laughs> he was. God bless Father James Mertz. Um, but, you no, know, this is a, a, a call to be faithful unto death. And that's what Jesus said in John 21, verse 22. When Jesus said to Peter, if it is my will that he, John, remain until I come, what is that to you? Don't worry about anybody else. What he says is, is follow me. I don't worry about somebody else's vocation. I'm not living their life. I have to follow Jesus in my life. So this, um, this is a, a following, which is a sequela Christi, that is a following of Jesus, to the point of total self-giving, even in martyrdom. And we have many priests still being martyred. Priests are being killed in Pakistan and uh, other countries. And uh, in, in Iraq, priests celebrating mass have been blown up. A bishop captured and killed, along with priests and deacons. Uh, you know, this is not of a long time ago. And we saw martyrdoms of priests throughout the time of the atheistic governments, whether it be under the Nazis, in their atheism, they killed one-third of the priests of Poland. And in, uh, the atheists of Soviet Union, the atheists hated the priesthood and executed them by the thousands, thousands. So, you know, the atheists, instead of the Roman Empire, are trying to wipe us out. But so far, um, we keep having more priests. Even in the Soviet Union, they kept on having it. So this is going to be to the point of death, like Peter himself died as a martyr, being crucified, as Jesus had predicted. All right, we'll take a little break. We'll come back, we'll get some questions from our studio audience, and then continue on with this section. So please stay with us. Thank you and welcome back. Uh, we have a wonderful audience here. We have folks from a, a couple of groups, it looks like, uh, and folks from scattered around parts of the country. Welcome to the folks from Pittsburgh. Good, that hence the penguin reference that they're Catholic <laughs> penguin fans anyway, uh, not actual penguins. <coughs> Excuse me. But also we have folks from Minnesota and Arkansas and all sorts of other places, so it's Florida. We'd love to have you come. <coughs> <coughs> come and visit us as well. So contact 
our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966. That's 205-271-2966. Or go to our website, www.ewtn.com. And um, I want to invite folks to come with me to the Holy Land. One of the folks here asked about it. I thought this would be a good time to uh, announce it. Um, I'll be going to the Holy Land December 15th to the 26th. And I just checked today. So far, the ash cloud is nowhere near uh, <laughs> Tel Aviv Airport. So they're, they're okay. It, it, they uh, are able to get in and out with no problem. So hopefully. Oh, I'll have to pray for the folks in uh, Europe, though. That, that's you know, a serious issue. But at, at any rate, we're planning on going again for Christmas, December 15th to the 26th. And you can find out about it by calling 1-800-554-4556. 1-800-554-4556. Or go to my website, www.fathermitchpacwa.org, and we'll have information there as well. All right, let's get some of our questions and from our studio audience. Let's start off with this gentleman here. Sir, where are you from? From Canada, Toronto. Great, and that's right, I forgot to mention, uh, we have folks from Canada here, so it's wonderful to have you. And what is your question? Thank you very much. Uh, is there any plans in the vacation of the priesthood to shorten the, the term of being a priest? Uh, in terms of the amount of studies yes. that he does? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, no, we don't want to shorten it. Um, there's a, a lot that needs to be done. And it's not only the amount that you learn, but the length of studies is part of the process of letting a man think about what he's doing. See if he can live the life. And, you know, by living in the seminary and then trying out some of the ministry work by going in the parishes and such. So it, it, it's an important thing to have a delay. Now, uh, as a matter of fact, that's why I'm, I don't think that eight years is necessary to prepare for a wedding engagement. You can do that more quickly. But um, it, it's important to have preparation for marriage, too. You know, that we don't want people running, rushing into these things. You have to think about them carefully and make sure that it's a real decision that uh, comes from inside. So, no, I, I don't think that uh, we want to shorten it at all. Yeah. And we have another question. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Great. And Penguins fan? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and your question? My question is, with Pope Benedict naming this the year of the priest, do, does and do priests get strength from that with the sexual assault on our, yeah. on our church? Yeah, here's, uh, th that's an important question. I think when uh, Pope Benedict you know, declared that this would be a year for priests. The idea was to have a sense of encouraging priests because we've gone through the crisis. But now we've seen it start all over again. And it's not only old cases, it's trying to implicate Pope Benedict and a lot of other people. And, you know, there, there are a couple elements. Uh, matter of fact, I saw a really good article by Alan Dershowitz, uh, the, the, the lawyer. Um, you know, he said, look, there's some people who are trying to blame this on the Jews, are trying to attack the church. That's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. And, you know, <laughs> all of a sudden the Kennedys are Jewish? That's crazy. <laughs> that problem comes from the Kennedys. You know, Patrick Kennedy and Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, they, have, they cause more trouble than, than anything in, on, on terms of going after the church and not on the sexual uh, conflict, but uh, the, the sexual abuse scandal. But, you know, to say that that's, uh, th there's no need for that kind of talk. Um, you no, know, but we do have to pay attention to what another Jewish man, a uh, man named Miller had said, namely that the, um, there's something funny about this whole scandal because it seems as if the Catholic Church is being singled out. You know, the, this, you have the, the, the number of cases is 1.7 to 1.8 percent of the priests. And I just saw a quick thing on CNN yesterday where they were saying, now we're going to keep monitoring this, how it, it's because we know that it's going to start spreading in Latin America and in Africa where there's more growth, as if this is necessary 
within the Catholic Church. And they're looking for it. They're looking for it. And that has nothing to do with religious enemies. I think this is our secular opponents. And I'm, I'm very concerned because uh, as uh, Sojourners Magazine brought out, the percentage of Protestant ministers involved in sexual abuse is larger, according to Sojourners, which is a Protestant uh, magazine. And they're not trying to put down Protestants. Protestantism, they're Protestants. And they're not, so they're not blaming Jewish people or Muslims or anybody else. Uh, it's something that's very odd. Why are they singing us out when the percentage is considerably higher? I think it's something like uh, 10%, something like that. It, it's, uh, you know, much higher. But, you know, this, for, for us, it's, it's news on a regular basis. And I think that it's an animus toward us on other issues. Our, our stance is on issues like abortion and the life issues and other what are perceived as political issues. So this is meant to strengthen us, but also Pope Benedict is being very clear. These, the 1.7, 1.8% 1 of the priests who did this abuse did a horrible thing without any justification Without, there's no exonerating them. Even if somebody from another religion did no, more from another, that has nothing to do with the fact that these guys did, you know, broke their trust and, and, uh, and did some horrible things. That is unjustifiable on any basis at all. And so he's also calling us at this time to deeper penitence and for all of us to do penance to pray for the victims. That still needs to be number one. The story is not, a, again, I, I worry that some of these people in the press are trying to use this to go out to Catholic leaders when the story is about the people who are abused. They're the ones who need to be helped. That is number one issue. And their families, secondarily. And the scandal caused to the people of God and then also us priests. So. You know, maybe we need to renew, maybe not the Lenten penance during this Easter season, but to do penance so that we don't uh, omit praying for and caring for those who were hurt. That's very, very important. So that that's, would be one thing. And I think this year, to, to call us to what the priesthood is supposed to be in order to, to summon us priests to be faithful to the trust that we have and that the 98% plus of priests who are faithful, and, and most of whom, again, this uh, a businessman named, a Jewish businessman named Miller said, most priests are happy with their work. They're, they're saving the government billions, billions with our Catholic schools and hospitals. We are providing great service. So we have to have that renewed as well. Okay, you have another question? Please. Yes, and uh, where are you from? I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Great, and your question? Um, I have a two-part question. Yeah? Uh, my first question is, Father, um, in my parish in Pittsburgh, when I go to confession, yeah. um, our priest, well, my, our priest, he, he just says, confess mortal sins and no venial sins. And the second part of my question, our church, um, before Mass and after Mass, Father, it's like a social hall. Yeah. I mean, there's talking, right. there is, there's no respect for the Eucharist, right. and it's terrible. Let me, let me respond to both of those. First of all, the priest has no right to tell you mortal sins only. <laughs> I, I, I made a, a, a joke uh, w last year when we had um, a bishop, the pastor, a young priest, and I hearing confessions, all right? I said, all the big sinners go to the bishop. <laughs> Young sinners go to the new priest, and everybody who can't stand the pastor come to me. <laughs> but they, they knew I was joking because you cannot say that, uh, and the pastor knew I was joking, and, uh, but you, know, you can't say only mortal sins because that means, therefore, you're revealing that everybody in the line has committed mortal sin. The priest has no right to say, okay, mortal sinners only. You can't do that. You can't do that. And secondly, there is grace to be won by confessing the venial sins. Now, perhaps 
in terms of uh, the, the uh, con confessing one's sins, you know, some people do take more time than the priest may have if he has a long line. You have to just make sure you get through your sins and you, he's got to deal with everybody else. But, you know, you have, to, you have to be willing to hear every sin that's confessed. So that's one thing. Secondly, one of the things in terms of an antidote to all those people talking, what I would suggest is that some folks go to Mass early and start praying the rosary out loud. And so that way, there's praying going on. We do that at our parish. The priest and the deacon and the deacons uh, will come out before Mass and we start saying the rosary. And they won't get it right away. But if you have a group that's large enough and loud enough and consistent and being there, and I bet you might find a few folks that could just fit that bill. So try that, try that. Or the Divine Mercy Chaplet. So, and you have one question, last question? Good evening, Father. Yes, yeah. it uh, relates to ordination. Yeah. And we have uh, some priests in our diocese that uh, celebrate Mass in different rites. Yes, I do that myself. Okay, and the, um, the question I had was, are they ordained in each rite that they are able to say Mass in, or are they ordained in, in one rite, let's say the Roman Catholic rite, and then just given faculty to uh, say the Mass in the other rites? And right. A, a priest is ordained once, and if he gets permission to be by ritual from the patriarch of that rite and the Roman patriarch, which is the Pope, then he may go ahead and celebrate the liturgy. And he may not mix the liturgies. Oh, I like this, like, like I'm by ritual with the Maronite rite. Uh, let's take this Maronite thing, we'll put that with the Roman rite and the Roman rite thing. No, you know, we can't mix. This is not Mr. Potato Head approach to the liturgy. <laughs> no mixing and matching. So, uh, so you have to do that um, uh, faithfully. But you're ordained once because it's an indelible mark, an indelible character. You receive it at, at uh, baptism and ordination and confirmation. So that's just one ordination. All right, thanks for your questions. All right, now we are back in paragraph 70.11, talking about how at the synod from which this document came, um, they gave reasons to justify the need for ongoing formation for priests. And they also wanted to see that the deep nature of ongoing formation is faithfulness to the priestly ministry is one thing. So that in order to be faithful to the priestly ministry, we have to keep on learning. Secondly, there's also a process of continual conversion. Again, th that's part of any vocation in marriage. You keep on realizing, I didn't realize that that bothered you, honey. You know, and, uh, and you find out, but <laughs> sometimes in a tough situation, but you find out. And the same thing for us priests. We have to have ongoing conversion so that we become more priestly and more Catholic, more Christian, more committed to Jesus, like the apostles did. Once he was, they were there, do you think that he just, you know, said, oh, everything is fine, now you guys are my disciples. No, he hollered at them. What are you two arguing about? Or, oh, you who are slow of heart and mind to understand the words of the prophets and the law, you know, and, and the way to Emmaus. You know, so, uh, and he rebuked them I, at, when he saw the big crowd of them in Matthew 28, because some of them didn't believe. So he's going to have this ongoing uh, process of continual conversion. And it is the Holy Spirit who's poured out in the sacrament of holy orders, as he is in all the sacraments, but it's the Holy Spirit who sustains the priest in this faithfulness and accompanies the priest and encourages him along the path of unending conversion. It's not that the priest is just walking a tightrope. Oh, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I can fall. Oh, no. You know, we're going with the Holy Spirit. That's what's key here, and we need His gift. And that the gift of the Holy Spirit does not take away the freedom of the priest. He still has free will. But um, the priest is called to use this freedom to cooperate responsibly with the Holy Spirit. That my free will is to say yes to the urgings of the Holy Spirit. There are times I might say, I want to stay home. I don't want to go to this place, to that place, to the other. But, you know, this is where 
I'm called to be faithful and to cooperate with uh, this, uh, especially with the task of formation, and that this is something that uh, of permanent formation, ongoing learning is entrusted to the priest. That's why, you know, when I'm preparing homilies and, and, and talks, I can't just say, oh yeah, I've got some old notes from 10 years ago. No, I need to just continue to read new commentaries and new articles and understand more deeply uh, so that uh, I have a, an ongoing conversion of understanding. And this um, uh, permanent formation is a requirement of the priest's own faithfulness to his ministry. If he's not willing to keep learning, he's not going to be faithful to his vocation. Just like a married couple. Is it really being faithful to your wife and saying, I don't need to listen to you anymore. Just leave me alone. I am work. I bring the paycheck home. Just let me drink a beer. Uh, you know, this isn't Ralph Cramden. You know, this isn't Archie Bunker. Th that, that's comedies about how ridiculous. But that's not the norm. Is that real marriage? No. There's an ongoing learning about your vocation and development by both parties. So, so also with us priests. This is all about love for Jesus Christ, number one, and for the church. And it's not about promoting my, uh, my career. And this is something that everybody in the church has to be alert to. It's tempting to think, yeah, if I get close to the bishop, and if I sort of hang around and get on the right committees, and then maybe I'll get to be a monsignor or a pastor. Or if I'm really good, I'll be a bishop too. Well, <laughs> you know, that's not what it is. It, it's about love of Jesus and being faithful to the vocation he's given us. Faithfulness to yourself. That's what it's, it's really important. And it's got to be an act of love for the people of God. This is key that I'm doing this because the, pe the church needs us priests. And it needs us to be there for them. Um, because we're, we are at their service. That's why, you know, one of the things I, I was discussing with a priest over the weekend, how it, it's very important that when we are dealing with even our sermons, the question should be, wow, I heard there's a new theory about the crucifixion and the family of Jesus, and there's a new DVD and all this stuff, and I want to give them the newest and latest ideas. Why? What's that got to do with anything? The question is, more importantly, Lord Jesus, what do you want me to preach to your people? This is not about my great ideas coming out. What do you want me to preach to your people? That's why I have to keep renewing my study of Scripture. Because the situation, you know, I might have the same readings every three years, but the situation of the church or the place where I'm preaching, because I travel so much, is going to be different. So I have to be alert. Lord, would you want me to speak to your people? That's where the love of Jesus and the love of the people comes across. And it's an act of true and proper justice. The priest owes it to God's people who have a fundamental right to receive the word of God, not a letter from second opinions. It's not about my opinion or second opinions or anybody else's opinion. I'm here to be faithful to the Word of God. And I am the servant of the Word of God, as the whole church is. The Vatican Council, the Council of Trent, the First Vatican Council, all talk about us being at the service of the Word. And that's why I owe it in justice. And that the, we all have, a, they have a right to receive the sacraments and the service of charity. It's not that... You know, uh, you know, because I'm such a sweetheart, I, I say Mass on Sunday. No, this is a fundamental right of the parish to have Mass. And I'm there so that the people of God have that right that belongs to them by their baptism. We are not in a situation of persecution. So I will be there to the best of my ability. And that's number one. More important than, yeah, but wouldn't I really be better for them if I went and played golf? No, 
come there to proclaim the gospel and to give them the sacraments, to give them Jesus. And this is the original and irreplaceable content of the priest's pastoral ministry. And he has to acknowledge that and foster it and develop it. So ongoing formation is necessary to ensure that the priest can respond to this right that the people of God have. And we're going to be seeing a new translation of the Mass coming. So we priests have an obligation so that the people have the Mass celebrated correctly. They have a right, not only Vatican II, but also the canon law says you have a right to the legitimate celebration of the liturgy. That is your right. That's why you should call this piece if we're messing around with the liturgy. It's not ours to play with. And the heart and form of the priest's ongoing formation is pastoral charity. That I love the people of God like a shepherd. I'm trying to lead them. I want to lead the sheep to the good pasture that our Lord offers them. So that pastoral charity is the, the very heart of formation. Again, it's not about getting on the right committees. It's about serving the people uh, as pastors. And it's the Holy Spirit who infuses pastoral charity. I can't just make this up. If I'm making it up, then it's a mere human program. But it's the Holy Spirit who gives us that love, that, that pastoral charity, and who introduces and accompanies the priest to a deeper understanding of the mystery of Christ. Because we're dealing with mysteries. We talk about the mysteries of the rosary. These are mysteries beyond human comprehension. And the Holy Spirit leads us into that. Um, which It's an unfathomable mystery. A mystery beyond human depth. That's what keeps it interesting. If it weren't a mystery, it would be boring because I could understand it. But because it's always beyond my comprehension, it maintains fascination for us. And that's why he cites Ephesians 3, 14 and 15, where he says, for this reason, I, but St. Paul wrote, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every fa family in heaven and on earth is named. So must be priests do before the mystery of God. And in turn, we have a, uh, also our call to a knowledge of the mystery of Christian priesthood. When you, with the mysteries, you know different aspects of it. You don't know the, the whole mystery, but you know certain things that you must maintain or else you would destroy the mystery. So also with the priesthood. And pastoral charity itself impels the priest to an ever deeper knowledge of the hopes and the needs and the problems of the people, the sensibilities of the people that he ministers to. And he wants to understand their situations as individuals, what's going on with their families, in society and in history. And this requires ongoing formation because all of these things change. There's development going on, so we need to learn more. This is the object of ongoing formation in that it is, must be understood as a conscious and free decision do I got to study another course? I don't want to read. Stop that whining or I'll give you something to whine about. <laughs> Sorry, Dad. <laughs> That's a voice out of the past. <laughs> but no, you want to live, it's a conscious and free decision to live out the dynamism of pastoral charity in the Holy Spirit, who is the first source of charity and the constant nourishment of charity so that we, we are in this dynamic of studying and listening to the Spirit and the Holy Spirit is working in us. And in this sense, ongoing formation is an intrinsic requirement of the gift and of sacramental ministry received. And it's necessary in every age. There's no time when priests need to not only go through long years of formation, as the question from Canada, but you keep on studying because you still didn't learn it all. And you won't. The older we get, the more we realize how little we know. It's very urgent today because there's rapid changes in society and culture uh, and individuals and peoples. But also, and this is one that's key, this ongoing education is necessary so we can do the new evangelization. 
I know there's some priests say, oh, you don't try to win anybody to Christ. Baloney, that is exactly what we do. We win them to Jesus so that they can know him and his sacraments and go to heaven and not go to hell. And may you all be strengthened in this, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you.